I hope that by hosting this program, we're beginning to do just that. It's an exciting moment and an important turning point for all of us. We're so thrilled to partner with Lex Pride and PFLAG to present this program to bring to light the experiences of LGBTQ people in Lexington today and throughout the past 50 years. We plan to present more programs in the future to highlight other aspects of the history through the LGBTQ lens. On your chair is a piece of paper with a survey. It has a calendar of upcoming events and, very importantly, a membership form. Without our membership program and the support of our members, we would not be able to present programs like the one tonight. Uh, thank you all again for joining us tonight, and thanks to Lex Pride and PFLAG for your collaborative energy. I will now welcome Lex Pride's Val Overton to make some remarks and present our speaker. Thank you. Um, so I'm Val Overton, I'm co-chair of Lex Pride, and I would also like to welcome you and thank you for coming to our event this evening. So Lex Pride is an organization that uh, fosters safety and inclusion of LGBTQ people, their families and allies um, in Lexington. And uh, because we cross all demographics, that means we therefore work for inclusivity of all peoples of all kinds of identities. Um, and we try to reflect that in all of our work. So thank you for coming. Um, I, without further ado, I will just uh, mention that there are sheets about Lex Pride up front, and I will introduce our speaker. So, Professor Gary Bailey, um, he, him, DHL, MSW, ACSW, is Professor of Practice at the Simmons School of Social Work, and at the School of Nursing and Health Sciences, coordinator of the dynamics of racism and oppression and the health and aging sequences, affiliate faculty for the Center for Primary Care at Harvard Medical School, director of the Urban Leadership Program at Simmons University, commissioner of the Massachusetts Commission for LGBTQ Youth, member of the board for the Massachusetts Educational Financing Authority, and he has served on numerous boards and advisory groups um, and has received far too many awards and honors to, for me to list here. Uh, a highly sought after trainer and consultant, he offers expertise on issues pertaining to social justice and human rights, diversity, working with LGBTQ communities, and health and aging. We are honored and grateful to have Professor Bailey here with us today. I'm absolutely delighted to be here uh, this evening and bring regards from uh, Simmons University and from our provost, Kathy Conboy, uh, Kay Conboy, and from our president, Helen Dryden, and from my colleagues at the, at the university. Um, it's an interesting moment in time as we look at this 50th anniversary uh, commemoration. I'm not going to say anniversary, because I'll talk about that in a, in a bit but this commemoration of uh, the Stonewall Riots, and I am deliberate in that, that Stonewall was a riot, and the ways in which we have sanitized what happened 50 years ago um, is something that we need to go back and make very clear about what, why, when, and who, um, because uh, what I refer to, some people refer to as the sanitization of the movement in the moment, um, I refer to as the Cloroxing of the movement in the moment. Because in effect, if you listen to what is going on now and the ways in which people talk about that moment um, in New York City um, in 1969, um, there's an absence of black and brown people. Um, and there would not have been a movement if it had not been for black and brown transgendered individuals. So we didn't use the language transgender. Then we talked about um, transvestites, we talked about drag queens, we talked about queens, there's lots of language. So I want to give a disclaimer tonight. Looking back 50 years, I'm not going to be using language that is the language of 2019 in order to have a discussion about something 50 years ago. That's revisionist history. And so we have to use the language of the day to talk about that moment in time and then to move that language forward. So as we look now in 2019, um, as we look at the emergence um, in very powerful ways of the term queer, 50 years ago, that wasn't a term uh, that people used for lots of reasons. It was, in many instances, at least in my life as I was coming up, it was a fighting word. Uh, 
um, it was not meant in a way that was positive or affirming in any way, shape, or form. And it is not by accident that you will find uh, numbers of individuals who are of a certain age who still don't embrace that term um, because it's a loaded term. So when we begin using terminology, you also want to understand the generational markers uh, and that words have meaning and that people are not necessarily prepared to do the work um, to embrace the new nomenclature about certain things. But that will come back to, to all of that. Um, but 50 years ago, if we thought about what was going on around LGBT issues uh, in this country, I wouldn't imagine, I would think that many of you sitting here tonight wouldn't have imagined that here in the historical society, you'd be having a discussion to celebrate or commemorate pride in Lexington, um, regardless of the history of Lexington as a, a point of revolution, that that just would be something one would talk about, right? Uh, and so we've come a long way. So we use the Sankofa-esque moment of standing in the present, looking forward, but also looking backward. Uh, we have to be able to uh, really uh, enjoy the moment in time of what we've achieved, um, to understand the challenges of what lay ahead of us. Um, I would encourage us as we think about this 50th commemoration, uh, and we label this and talk about this these moments, or this moment as a civil rights moment, that there are lessons to be learned about how you're never in a position of being completely safe in what you've achieved. If we look at what's happening now in this country around civil rights and civil rights legislation, we look at the backsliding of what's happening by people in power to try to undo what has been achieved, if one is going to learn any lessons, and some of the lessons learned from the civil rights movement was after 100 plus years, some people would say 400 years of pushing to gain rights in this country, people got tired, caught a breath, and began to rest for a moment. And the vigilance is what's necessary. So as we look at what's happening now to transgender individuals with this administration of taking back and rolling back rights, we have to stay vigilant. We have to stay vigilant on all that. So that's the lesson learned as we celebrate our achievements we look back and understand that these battles were hard fought, but they were something that no one gave us. We fought for them. And then we think about what we're going to have to do going forward for the next generations. Um, that is what I want to accomplish tonight. So is that acceptable yes. to all of you? OK. Um, so and I'm going to look a little confused, because what I'm seeing on the screen doesn't, is not necessarily what you're seeing up here, so I'll, I'll work with that. <laughs> um, what I tell my students all the time in class, and I start every class with this quote, a text without a context is just a pretext for whatever you want it to mean. Now, what I'm talking to my students about is theory. theory. It, you, know, you can look at all sorts of theory, but if you don't have a context for what you're reading, um, it can mean whatever it is you want it to mean. Now, Ben Witherington is a theologian. Um, and uh, he, like his father before him, is a brilliant theologian, and what he was writing about uh, when this quote came about, was he was talking about the New Testament. That you can't look at the New Testament without understanding the times in which it was written. So that when we look at any kind of old and ancient text, we really need to be able to look at the times. And what happens very often is that we apply today's meaning to something that was written yesterday. So as we look at the movement and the moment, we're looking through a 2019 lens at something that happened in 1969. Now, show of hands, how many of you remember 1969? That's a good, that's a good number. No, 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 that's a good number. This is my third talk, my next talk on out during Pride Month. I've done four, this, my fourth talk is on Monday at Boston City Hall. I cannot tell you how many people don't have a clue when I say 69, so I keep going up. 79, the hand doesn't go up. 89, oh, well, maybe somewhere in there. And so there's a whole swath of history that's missing about the context of the times. And so we're going to spend some time talking about that as well. Um, we can't talk about uh, the, we can't talk about the 60s until we go back and really talk about what was, what led up to the 60s. And that was really looking at what was going on for then homosexuals. So let's talk about language. Um, homosexuals in the 50s, um, in the McCarthy era, which is a period that 
we don't talk about as much as, as we should, but what it meant to live in a time when neighbors were being encouraged and supported by their government to tell our other neighbors when we were routing out uh, the Red Scare, uh, supposedly, and trying to figure it out and find communists in and amongst us, um, that we don't talk about the Lavender Scare, uh, what was going on for um, LGBT people who were living um, in communities during this period um, and who were in fear for their existence and their lives. Um, because of what was going on, and that the loss of jobs, being arrested, uh, lack of due process. Um, uh, you know, we think about, we look at the numbers of suicides that were happening because people's lives were being, well, you could not, uh, if you were identified as being homosexual in a public way, um, and your profession required you to be licensed or certified in any way, uh, that could be a reason to deny you your certification or your license. And that, that's the power of that moment. So to be a doctor or to be a nurse or to heaven forbid you think about being a clinician or a therapist, um, that wasn't going to wasn't going to happen. So these were really um, horrible, horrible times. And I just want to share with you a small clip um, from a documentary uh, that is called the, the Lavender The Lavender Scare. That's not it. <laughs> wasn't present, and we can never assume that LGBT people weren't present. We just can't. Um, it's the ways in which we think about uh, the presence of diversity and difference as being automatically visible and something that we can see and tell. I don't know, if any of you watched, there was a great piece on uh, PBS um, many, many years ago uh, that looked at was telling the story of what it meant to be a pilgrim or a Puritan and coming and setting up space in America. Anyone remember this show? They used to do, they did one on Victorian, what it meant to live as a Victorian, what it meant to live as this and that. And they had someone living as, a group of people living as Puritans. So they had to work with the land and do all these other things. And in this PBS documentary, what was really fascinating was they talked about what it meant to have a gay member of the community. And uh, the ways in which uh, the pillory, uh, the ways in which they were treated, uh, the horrors that they dealt with, uh, in this instance that did not occur, but it was a teachable moment uh, to talk about what it meant uh, to be a part of that community um, at that time. Is that unfrozen? Technology, though, is supposed to help us in the beta of our existence. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll move on. So, what the Lavender Scare was going to show you uh, was the the ways in which society was set up to not only discriminate but to control um, gay people during this period, and it was controlling through fear. Um, the ways in which one's uh, life and livelihood um, could be uh, controlled and taken away. And what it also meant to have people who were um, arrested, uh, interviewed, et cetera. And the most egregious part of this documentary and in this period is what happened when you were supposed to identify others. So it put your moral integrity at place. And one person in the documentary in this clip talks about how he had to make a decision to identify the people who had the least to lose. Mm -hmm. That's powerful. Yeah. Um, because what you're trying to do is, it's like Sophie's choice. So which, who am I going to save, but ultimately who am I going to betray? And all I could help to think about is this gentleman now, at this point in time, is telling this story about what the weight of that that he's carried around with him um, for his life. And his is not a single story of people who were asked to. Um, oh, that's okay. You can have the slides later if I can ever get them back. That would be wonderful. Um, and so th they led us to talk about a Dr. Frank uh, Kameny. Frank Kameny. 
um, is a name that many people talk about as being the father of the movement. Um, Dr. Camney in the uh, 1950s, in 1957, uh, was dismissed from his position as an astronomer, uh, astronomer in the U.S. Army's map services in Washington, D.C. Um, because of his homosexuality. Uh, and that, unlike others who had been in similar positions, what Dr. Camney did was he fought back. Um, he sued the U.S. government. He sued to be restored. He did not deny that he was homosexual, the latest language. Um, but he also said that that had nothing to do with his, the performance of his job. Uh, and so he went as the first person who sued the um, U.S. government um, based on uh, being fired because of his sexual orientation, sexual identity. Um, he did not win the case, but is really credited with helping to infuse into um, a nascent, um, emerging movement uh, with groups like the Daughters of Belitis, the Mattachine Society, which were groups in those days, of helping them to begin to find uh, some sense of militancy. Now, it's very interesting when you look at the pictures and think about what militancy looked like in those days. It's not the militancy that we would think about now. It's not the act up kind of militancy or um, uh, you know, the Black Panthers or any of those things. I mean, we're talking about militants who are in coat and ties and uh, heels protesting with placards. Um, but the mere fact that they were living and being authentic was militant. It was revolutionary. And Dr. Kameny uh, is one of those people who is credited with uh, that aspect of infusing into the early movement that kind of, of uh, agency, if you will, to be able to say, yes, I am, and uh, I have the right to be treated with dignity and with respect. Um, the great gift, if you watch Dr. Kameny's story, is to watch it come full circle for him and for him to be honored um, at a meeting at the White House by President and Mrs. Obama um, to be acknowledged for his contribution. Um, so some would argue that he was in the right place at the right time in the 50s and that he was in the right place um, to get his accolades um, during the past administration. Um, but and he died, um, interestingly enough, uh, like many, um, older people without family, um, having led a good life, but really died alone because there was a certain degree of social isolation um, that came in. So it's to look at the, the variety of instances that uh, impact someone's life. Stonewall was not the first uh, uprising that occurred. Uh, so the first gay uprising in the United States occurred in 1959. Uh, it happened in Los Angeles um, at the Cooper's Donuts in LA. Um, which was a, uh, occurred in a section of LA that was then known as the uh, gay section uh, with um, transgender individuals and hustlers and all sorts of other denizens of uh, that community at that time. And uh, the donut shop had been the go-to place in the community. So where you could get a cheap cup of coffee, have a booth in which you could sit, um, and spend some time after, um, after a bar had closed. And so the importance of, the, of this institution for the community was significant. And so again, not unlike Stonewall, what you had was in May of 1959, a group of drag queens and hustlers who fought the police. Um, and every one of these movements, what they have in common, um, from Cooper's Donuts to uh, other mo moments that we'll talk about, has been really fighting back against the police authority and brutality and the abuse of police uh, authority. Um, so that as we think now, as we are commemorating the 50th anniversary of Stonewall, we also need to pay, be paying attention to what's going on. It is not an accident that groups like Black Lives Matters have been founded by queer individuals who are also taking on and dealing with issues of the police. Um, so that the presence of police and police using their authority, and I'm not anti-police by any stretch of the imagination, what I am saying is that we can also have abuses of authority and power 
and that those have to be checked. And that's what happened um, at the donut shop. Um, and LAPD police were notorious uh, for abuses of power during that time. Uh, and Cooper's, uh, in his book, uh, City of Night, John Reggie, who was one of the hustlers at, the, at Cooper's that evening, um, basically was one of the people who the police tried to arrest. So John Reggie went on to become a, a well-known author um, but who took great pride in being a gay hustler and wrote from that perspective, um, was one of the people who was being arrested along with other um, young individuals um, and that they fought back. And so Cooper's in 1959 um, be becomes what is considered the first gay uprising um, in modern history. Um, we then, that was then followed by the Compton's Cafeteria Riot. Um, and again, both of these are in California, one in LA and the other in San Francisco in the Tenderloin. And that occurred in August 1966. Um, this incident was one of the first recorded LGBT-related riots um, in United States history, uh, following Cooper's Donuts, um, and then again proceeding by three years um, the fight at Stonewall, but again, these are concentrated on the West Coast. So why is this important? Um, one of the things that we do in history is we look at the pivotal moment without forgetting all the antecedents that led up to the moment. Uh, we talk about, and, and appropriately so, Rosa Parks without talking about all the other people sat down first. Because it wasn't, I would argue, it is never the end moment, it is the cumulative nature of all of the moments. Um, that lead to what we think of as being the watershed moment, but that there are a number of moments um, in parts of the country where people were resisting uh, and pushing back. Uh, the Gene Compton's riot is commemorated um, in San Francisco um, with a, uh, a marker uh, to acknowledge that this piece of history did exist. And this is very important because as we move beyond these periods, people begin to fit, forget these historical moments and forget to mark them. Um, I was struck the other day when I was walking around Bay Village in, in Boston uh, to come upon uh, the marker for the Coconut Grove. Anyone remember or heard of the Coconut Grove fire? We talk to some people, they don't even know what you're talking about, but there is a, a stone that commemorates this fire that changed lives in ways that, you know, the old saying was that there was almost no one in Boston who didn't know someone who was impacted by the fire. Um, and so with the passage of time, we begin to forget those moments and forget that history and those memories. So let's think about what was going on 50 years ago before Stonewall, at the time of Stonewall. So 50 years ago, if you were an LGBT individual here in the United States and we really weren't using language about bisexuals, we weren't using the language of transgender at that time. Um, people tended to be lumped together in this term, homosexual or faggots, or said, you know, we can go on and on with what the language um, was like. Um, your name, along with the name of your friends and family members, would be put on the list by the FBI, uh, because as a homosexual, you were prone to blackmail uh, and, quote, overt acts of perversion. I find it very ironic that given what we now know about the FBI uh, and J. Edgar Hoover, um, that this would be something that he would be policing, but it also says a lot about what happens with internalized oppression and how dangerous it is. Uh, and particularly when people who have that kind of internalized oppression also then have unfettered power. Um, you know, if you remember J. Edgar Hoover, we've not lived through a period recently where FBI directors have had that kind of uh, power, at least during the last few years. Uh, with J. Edgar Hoover, he had more power than, than the presidents he was supposedly serving. Um, and so this is someone who had the kind of power um, and the kind of tentacles in our society that he could do um, anything that he, he wanted to do. And, and really did, and was high focus on issues of race and racial justice and homosexuality were his areas of, of focus. Uh, the United States Post Office also kept your name on this gesundheit to monitor any homosexual paraphernalia 
you were receiving so they could tip off the police and you would be arrested. So your mails were being policed as a way of them giving information to the police so that you could be arrested. So if you were a homosexual individual, you were living basically in a police state where you had limited freedom of movement. You would be dishonorably discharged from the military, fired from your government job or job as a teacher or a professor at a college if you were suspected of being gay with no legal recourse. Your neighborhood would be swept periodically to arrest you and anyone else um, who was a presumed homosexual or wore clothes not fit for their gender. So anything that, um, any piece of clothing that was not gender specific um, could get you arrested. Um, and I want us to really think about what that, what that means is we're now in a period as we go forward to really think about this, what I refer to now as this, the Billy Porter moment of people taking back and owning clothes and wanting to take away the power of clothes and the labels that come with clothes, the labels were very strongly and strictly enforced um, during this period. A friend of mine grew up during this period who was straight, and one of the things she always says to me about um, this period, which she really equates to still being McCarthy, post-McCarthy, was the fear that she lived under as a child of doing anything that drew attention to her family. Mm -hmm that that was the pressure that she felt. That somehow she stopped celebrating, she can remember this, that she didn't participate in May Day. She used to create May Day baskets or something <coughs> to celebrate May Day. And she stopped doing them because as a kid she didn't want to be associated with communism. Because if she was associated with communism, it could get her family in trouble. So I want you to think about that internalization of the message. Right? that that's a very important thing about what people were dealing with during that period in, of the times. Uh, my industry, uh, the mental health industry, the American Psychiatric Association, classified homosexuality as a sociopath personality disturbance and you were considered mentally infirm. Um, so as we talk now about conversion therapy, we should be also going to be talking about during this period, uh, lobotomy, chemical, um, uh, castrations, uh, all sorts of things that were going on for people because it was seen as being a severe mental illness that needed to be fixed and needed to be controlled. Um, you could be arrested for holding hands in public with your partner, which would be a risk given the realities of what you saw was happening around you. Uh, there was no GLAD or Lambda or any place for you to go um, to have someone to plead your case. And it would not be unusual for an attorney of any note or any record to not want to take your case, to not be associated uh, with you. Um, and so that became an opening for organized crime. When we begin to think about the places where if you can't go to the police, if you can't use the legal system to your your benefit, it opens up the opportunity for organized crime. So when we begin to think about um, places like Stonewall or um, the merry-go-round or um, here in Boston, the other side, and most bars in Boston, if you think about the old bars had mob connections, um, because there was a group that could operate um, with a certain uh, freedom um, to run establishments as long as they were paying, paying off. Uh, and even then, there were certain consequences. And we'll talk about that um, in a moment. Uh, the Stonewall Inn was owned by the Genovese family, um, which, if you've ever heard of the Genovese, is a, an Italian uh, family. Such a mouth. We need to go down the half rabbit hole. Um, and they turned it into a gay bar in 1963. Uh, it had no running water. The glasses were dunked into standing tubs of water, so nothing, it was not sanitary, is the point here. Um, they lacked proper toilets. Um, it was one of the only places in New York City you could go to dance. Um, uh, supposedly the drinks were watered down, the beer was watered down, everything was subpar. But it was the only place that people had to go, or one of the few places people had to go, and particularly one of the few places that poor 
gay, lesbian, and trans people had to go. I mean, there are always where the like east side bars where people with money uh, were able to go, and there were lovely clubs. Uh, you know, there were uh, the gaieties, um, clubs where people who were um, professional um, uh, entertainers um, and uh, who <coughs> performed in women's clothing were accepted, but it was, up, it was uptown. Uh, protected by a certain um, invisible veil of privilege, of, of money and privilege, which is very powerful. And that was not Stonewall. Stonewall was not that place. Uh, a light would be cued uh, to let people know because you weren't supposed to dance with people of the same sex. So if you were dancing with people of the same sex, a light would come on that would be triggered by the doorman to let you know the police were in the bar and that if they caught you, you could be arrested. And so people would separate. So imagine those kinds of moments. Um, and you were supposed to stop dancing, stop touching. And you were supposed to, at that point, figure a way to get into a mixed gendered couple versus a same sex couple. So it's not surprising that this bar was often tense, um, that it was repressed, uh, that it was bigoted, um, and that uh, it was also fun. As hard as that is to believe, it was a place for people to be and a place for people um, to go where they could feel a part of something. So it became their space. Um, the lower part of the village, if any of you have been to Stonewall, um, we look now at this location as being prime real estate. Um, back in the day, that was not prime real estate. If you remember, uh, some of the areas, it's ironic to me to think about uh, New York University being right across the park. Um, so, but it's an interesting, an interesting period of thinking about this, this space um, that meant so much to so many, but really was so little and what it had to give, which also then speaks to the quality of people's lives in that, in that period of time. So it's important for us to also think about, as we think about 1969, let's think about what led up to 69. So what was going on in the 60s? What was happening in the 60s? Revolution. Revolution? Who said revolution? Okay. Revolution? Yeah. It was revolution. It was revolution everywhere. Um, you know, if we think about what was happening in this country, what we saw was, and it's not dissimilar to some of what I'm picking up now. We really were beginning to see a massive generational shift from the young to the old, or from the old to the young, uh, from those who had been in power, who had been running things, who were seeing a shift happening in terms of the numbers rising for the young people who didn't want to continue to do things the way it has always been done. And they were resisting and pushing back. Um, they were toppling governments. Um, you know, in effect, we can look at uh, across the globe. Uh, Charles de Gaulle was toppled by young power, young people's power. Um, LBJ, um, some people say yes, it was the war that did him in, but it was also the youth protesting in the streets that created the pressure that was there. So we had young people um, who were pushing back. Uh, we had Woodstock, uh, which was a seminal moment. Um, what else happened during that period? Vietnam. Vietnam, and what we saw with Vietnam was looking at a country that becomes divided in many ways. <coughs> we also see young people who are um, subject to the draft also looking at their lives differently um, in ways both in terms of their service, but also of what it means to be young and alive. So if you live to be 30, your life is over to some young people. What else? Assassinations. Assassinations, the key. Because what we're now beginning to see are things happening that and with such rapidity that it's almost, it's incomprehensible in some way. So, Medgar Evers, 1963, um, which was, people call it, or I call it an assassination, it was a political assassination. John F. Kennedy in 63, Malcolm X in 65, Martin Luther King in 68, Bobby Kennedy in 68. That is an intense five-year period. That is an intense five-year period of what we're looking at. And that is happening and leading, leading up to, I'm going to work. Not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think? Okay, I'm not going to look at it. <laughs> I'm not going to look at it. 
<laughs> so, but that, you know, that's where we are. So we get to 1969, and we have all of these things that have been churning in our society um, that, is it your, I thought it was thumbs up. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I can look. So that we have all of these things that are turning in our society. And LGBT communities are not immune to any of us. They're experiencing loss. Um, they are um, seeing, and for some young people, as I talked to people who were there, two friends who actually were at Stonewall the night of the riot, what they will say to me is, they had nothing to lose. They had absolutely nothing to lose. Um, because in effect, as we talk now about intersectionality, they talk about what it meant to be young, black, gay. So on one hand, you're trying to figure out what is society, is society ever gonna let me be fully, I am a man, the King Motion Movement, or can I also be who I am? Um, and trying to balance all of these pieces uh, was quite challenging. So this is the turbulent times that lead up to the moment. Another part of urban legend, or urban lore, if you will, um, is uh, that we are also entering the period 50 years of the death of Judy Garland. Um, and you know, there's always been, you can't unprove it, but you can't prove it, is the myth that um, Stonewall, the night of the Stonewall riots, really happened in part because of the death and funeral uh, of Judy Garland. Now, for many people here, you might not remember Judy Garland except to see her every now and then on The Wizard of Oz, <laughs> or Meet Me in St. Louis, or any of that. Um, you really want to think about an iconic figure for the LGBT community at that time, and some people argue not for everybody, but I would push back and say she, she was a big deal. If you take a little bit of Beyonce, you mix her with Lady Gaga, you still don't have it. <laughs> you just don't have it. Um, you know, because in effect, she really represented something that spoke to people in a way, and it really was her woundedness and her vulnerability in many ways. And so Garland was kind of it, and she wasn't afraid of the community. Rumor has it that her father was gay, um, so that there are lots of ways in which one can think about this. Um, you know, and so the message has always been that her funeral, that the day of the Stonewall riots was one of the, one of the, the matches that lit, lit the, um, the, the, um, lit the moment. Um, now there are those who would say that because of class distinction, she was not that important to the people at Stonewall. She was not that significant. It, her music wasn't what people were listening to. All right, I can hear some of that. And I can also say that you just never know what people are listening to. She was an entertainer. She was, she was that, that sort of thing. The, was that the causal agent for the riot? I don't think so. But could that have contributed to the cumulative nature of the evening? Quite possibly. Yes. You know, one, one take I heard on that was that um, actually it was more that more people showed up that to the night, bar, which made the crowd bigger. That that was had more to do with it. That people were aware of it. They, went, they felt like they wanted to be in community, so it might have just contributed to the crowd. That's so quite that's possible. We don't know. People are, you know, if you go on and Google this, it will keep popping up because people are, well, because in effect, the same way in which we're going to talk about, people want to know what. And in some ways, people want to know what because it's a whole question of replication. What are the conditions then that occurred and are they, can it repeat itself? Um, it was also, from what I understand, it was a warm night. You know, New York and those, I mean, getting out of the house. I mean, so there are lots of pieces um, that were playing here, but I wanted to make sure that I mentioned that piece. So on June 28, 1969, the Stonewall riots took place, um, and it is now credited with sparking the civil rights movement for the LGBT community in the United States. And as we are looking at this 50th commemoration, we are now looking at World Pride. Um, this is significant around the world. This was a global moment, though at the time, one would not have thought of it. 
as being such. But it is a global moment. And there's the old saying <laughs> that when America gets a, gets a cold, the rest of the world gets the flu. So that it, it is not possible to contain um, something um, this significant. And, but it is important to be able to talk about who were the movement. And as we look now at the, um, the ways in which the movement has been talked about, the mothers of the movement, um, Stormy DeLabry, um, is uh, was an entertainer, was a doorman, um, who admits throwing a punch or two, um, is unapologetic about it, um, you know, and so um, Stormy is someone whose name many people don't remember, but it is a name that people should remember um, because she was a uh, very important force. Marsha P. Johnson, um, who um, was experiencing homelessness and suffered from mental illness, um, but was also a prime figure um, in the village and was uh, embraced and appreciated by some and frightened others. Um, she's a complex character, but she is someone who is said to have been at Stonewall that night. Uh, people push back and say that she wasn't. We'll never know any of this. And we'll talk about why <coughs> Sylvia and Marsha are so important. And then Sylvia Rivera, uh, she and Marsha were friends. Sylvia has uh, had said um, that she was credited with throwing the first punch. She always said that she didn't throw the first punch, but she threw some. Yeah. Um, but she can't say that she was the first punch um, that happened. Uh, if we look at Sylvia and Marsha, um, they are uh, who, as people hold on to the statement of what happened that night, that it really makes people to understand that it was brown, that it was trans, um, and in effect that they were poor, dealing with issues that we continue to deal with, homelessness, mental illness, poverty, lack of uh, uh, constituency and prominence, any of those things. These were average people um, who were out there trying to make a living and who were part of the sex worker industry as well. And so that's who started the movement. On the other side, you have the police. The police were being paid off, uh, who were taking their monthly payments, um, and who still felt it was okay to come in and raise your bar, um, and felt it was important to come in and raise your bar. So that those become the mothers of the movement. Now in 2015, this becomes the revision of the movement. Yeah. Right? This is, was a film that was going to be put out, uh, that was going to tell the story of Stonewall. What do you see? A lot of men. A lot of men. Never met at the other two, but a lot of white men. What else? What jumps out? Hmm? And you've got, you've got the white male savior, front and center, in a tight white t-shirt. Because of course, that's what everyone wore then. You know? Um, and you've got him leading, because this is the narrative that's going to be sent out to the public, that he is the one who got tired and, and, and got everyone else to fight when he threw the punch. Um, there was a number of us who decided this film couldn't see the light of day, and basically began to take back and wanted to own the narrative. <coughs> The studio shelved the film because it was just hit with so much protest. This is not the first time that the queer community or the LGBTQ community has pushed back against films that misrepresented um, the community. And so a lot of the protests that emerged after Stonewall and in the 70s and the 80s had to do with gross misrepresentations of LGBT individuals in film because, in effect, you have a media that um, for lots of reasons still struggles with representing people in a way that is authentic and not stereotypic. And that has to do with who's in the room helping to make those decisions. 
And so that is a way in which we think about the Coroxing or the whitewashing of the movement. So I want to do in this section, I want to identify four individuals who in a um, post-Stonewall world are very significant in terms of their leadership. Um, James Baldwin, uh, I believe it was in 1963, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm almost positive. James Baldwin, who is, I consider one of America's great men of letters, great people of letters and writing in this country, wrote a book with a gay, a gay story called Giovanni's Room. Has anyone ever read it? It's a wonderful book. I encourage all of you to read it. It is a film that it is a book that's just waiting to be made into a film. Um, but Giovanni's Room, um, his editors told him he was crazy for writing it, that it would ruin his career if he wrote it anyway, and as a gay man, um, it was even more challenging for him to, uh, by his publisher's belief, it put him at greater risk to not have his writing taken seriously, which did not prove to be true. Um, James Baldwin said, you know from whence you came. If you know whence you came, there are absolutely no limitations to where you can go. And James Baldwin was someone who lived in an intersectional space, and that's the thematic piece of the people I'm going to identify for you now, is that they talked a great deal about what it meant for Baldwin. It was, what does it mean to be black? What does it mean to come from a community of faith? What does it mean to be gay? Uh, what does it mean to be a writer? What does it mean to be all of these different things that made him uniquely who he was? And that he wasn't willing to let go of any of those pieces. Baird Rustin. Uh, Baird Rustin, who is probably one of the more important figures during America's civil rights struggle. Um, how many of you are familiar with Rustin? Okay, that's good, not, not the whole world. Rustin was the architect, I'm sorry, you not know that? No, no, we just had a plate for lunch and surprise. Oh, the brother I was Oh, okay, all right. Um, but again, Bayard Rustin is the person who, if you ask me, they think, I would say to you that Dr. King created the March on Washington. Dr. King had an idea about the March on Washington, but Baird Rustin made it happen. Now what people don't tell you about the story of Baird Rustin was the way in which Baird Rustin, um, who was an openly gay, then homosexual person who never said he was not, who never apologized, who spent time in jail uh, for public indecency. Um, you know, one, of his, one of his arrests was he was arrested in a car having sex with two people. Um, and went to jail for, I think, 18 months or something like that. Um, he was just unapologetic um, about who he was. Um, and he was introduced to Dr. King by Coretta Scott King, Dr. King's wife, who knew of Baird's work um, through other channels, other sources, but knew of his work in the organizing world and introduced him to Dr. King. Um, Dr. King recognized his skill, they got involved. King, uh, being, we think of King now as always being this wise man, but we forget that Dr. King was a young man, a young person, and Baird was a little more sophisticated in some ways, so he knew some of the things about organizing, introduced him to the teachings of Gandhi and the, and the role of nonviolence, so that the whole part of the nonviolence of the movement came from Baird Rustin. It did not come from Dr. King. Baird Rustin is the person who worked with Dr. King, who up until that time had a gun at home to protect his family because their lives were in danger. That's Baird Rustin. Um, Baird Rustin, uh, who was used as a pawn uh, in a power struggle between uh, Dr. King, who was seen by Adam Clayton Powell, uh, the first African-American congressman elected after Reconstruction from the great city of New York, um, who really didn't, if you know anything about Adam Clayton Powell, you will know that he was someone who understood his space and place. He was a child of privilege. His father was a famous minister. Uh, he came from a family that expected certain things to be certain ways. Um, he was married to uh, the pianist uh, Hazel Scott, the African-American pianist Miss Hazel Scott. They were like Beyonce and Jay-Z of their day. Um, and in effect, uh, Adam Clayton Powell was not used to sharing space with anyone, and Dr. King, he saw as an interloper in his movement. 
And so what he did was to use Baird Rustin's homosexuality as the weapon to try to stop or to control Dr. King. And basically, from what we were led to believe, um, confronted Dr. King about Rustin's homosexuality and said that basically you can either get rid of him, which he didn't expect King to do, or um, people can draw their own conclusions about your relationship with him. So it was a black male moment. Um, Dr. King went back and rather than put Rustin, Rustin putting Dr. King in a position, uh, Rustin withdrew, agreed to work on the march, but not in a public way. So his work was done in the back door rather than the front door, and their relationship suffered. As a result, because Rustin had not felt that he was supported by Dr. King uh, in that moment. Audre Lorde, need I explain? Um, Audre Lorde, uh, who um, worked in non in intersectional feminism, um, she said, those of us who stand outside the circle of this society's definition of acceptable women, those of us who've been forged in the crucibles of difference, those of us who are poor, who are lesbians, who are black, who are older, know that survival is not an academic skill. It is learning how to take our differences and make them strengths for the master's tools, and this is the piece that you would have heard, for the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. So that's where that quote comes from and gets used over and over. They may allow us to rarely to beat him at his own game, but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. And this fact is only threatening to those women who still define the master's house as their only source of support. So in this statement, she is talking about Audre Lorde, who described herself as a warrior, a goddess, a lesbian, a feminist. Uh, her work with Adrian Rich, Rich helped move the dynamic of what black feminism was and what uh, white feminism was and where the two could work together but where they couldn't work together. Um, but that she never denied who she was in the context of her lesbianism. Which was so important, um, and it uh, becomes part of the hallmark of what makes her great um, today. But Audre Lorde um, is uh, was on the front lines of the movement. And if you want to read a great piece, the 1971 Essence magazine piece um, that was done with Audre Lorde and James Baldwin, where they talk to each other, they dialogue with each other, is something that you really should. Lead, to really look at two great minds. And what you have are Audre Lorde as a black lesbian uh, individual and James Baldwin as a black gay male talking about how they're different, how their gayness and their queerness is different. Um, and the power, even without power, how Baldwin's maleness still trumps her femaleness in terms of power and agency. It's a worthwhile piece to read if you want a historical piece. So we're now, in that piece, looking two years post Stonewall, that you can have a dialogue, that's how quickly things move, that now in 1971 you can have a dialogue in a magazine, uh, the premier black magazine, Essence, between two openly gay individuals of color in a national magazine. So things move quickly from a period where you could not even um, say that you were gay or have any kind of an accusation made. So we're looking at rapid movement during that period. And then finally, you have this. And this is one of the most important. This is the Diagnostic Statistical Manual um, that I affectionately refer to as the Therapist Bible. Um, this is the tool that we use to make to do our work in terms of diagnoses and to help facilitate our practice. Um, there's a great piece called Any One Words on This American Life. I would encourage all of you to listen to it. It was done in 2002. I see you nodding in your head. That really tells the whole story of how 81 words were removed from the Diagnostic Statistical Manual and changed people's lives. We, queer people went from being, uh, having been sociopaths to be normal people with just the flick of a pen. So when we think about it, 1973, 1973, I was just beginning my time at Tufts University. 
So I started Tufts University. Before this was started as a sociopath, and I exited Tufts University with no emotional or mental health problems, <laughs> according to the DSM. Now, I say that, I say that, and it gets, evokes a laugh, but I want you to think about what that does to your, human, your humanity and your humanness. You're the same person. Someone has gone off in a room and decided now you're an okay person and comes back, and it changes how you're seen in the context of the world around you just by 81 words. And what you really want to listen to when you listen to this recorded this discussion about those 81 words was that psychiatrists <coughs> who were in control of creating the manual did not believe that they knew any psychiatrists who were gay because they didn't know any who were out. Therefore, no one existed. And so it was an important thing for them to be able to interact in this meeting, when you'll see pictures of what this meeting was like, for them to be confronted by their colleagues who were gay. Did you have your hand? Yes, I think since you put that up, I just want to point out that um, DSM, until DSM-5, did not address uh, gender identity. Identity, right. And, and that's very specific, so it's great that they did this it still has, years ago. Yeah, it still has work to do. Yeah. And it keeps evolving over time. And the power of coming out, coming out <coughs> and being present in these rooms is so significant. There's a cost to what happens for people who do that, who become the standard bearers, and who become the, uh, the, the person who's going to educate um, the masses to try to make change. But if we don't do it, then it's missing from the discussion because it's always assumed we're not there. Representation matters, and that's, that's a very important piece. Here in Massachusetts, in 85, we begin to move very quickly, but we have the Dukakis moment, what some people would call the Dukakis failure. Um, Governor Dukakis with um, gay foster care. Um, you know, and again, this is an incident or a case where you had two individuals who lived on Fort Hill in Roxbury um, in Boston who um, two white gay men who <coughs> were uh, acting as foster parents. And they were doing it in a way it was understood by the Department of Social Services that they were doing it, but it was a very low-key kind of thing. There's not a lot of attention brought to this because the department needed places to place, hard to place foster kids, kids in the system, kids with emotional issues, health issues, etc. And so this was a place where they placed them. A Boston Globe reporter, <clears throat> not asked, but got wind of this and decided to write a story. Went to the two gentlemen who had the children and they asked him not to write the story because they felt there would be enormous repercussions to the story being done. Uh, the reporter went ahead and wrote the story, um, interviewed people on Fort Hill uh, in Roxbury. And Roxbury has always had a, a, a community uh, they used to be called the Fort Hill Ferries back in the day. Um, but there was a group of people living on Fort Hill who were very embedded in the community. Uh, this became fodder for the Boston Globe and for the Boston Le and for the Massachusetts legislature and everyone else. So it, it really became a cause to let children were removed, um, parents fought back. Um, Governor Dukakis then wanted to understand how could something like this ever have happened. Um, and then began to do an investigation, ordered Phil Johnson, his Secretary of Health and Human Services, uh, to investigate this. Um, and then out of this, uh, we ended up with the House of Representatives that is a very reactionary body um, and has particular interest in DSS, which it has recently formed, um, uh, so that they want to understand uh, what's happening, so they want a broader review. And out of all of this comes the protocol that says the priorities now of placing children in foster care in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has to do with, first and foremost, we want to place kids with straight couples. That's number one. Um, you then, if it's not a straight couple, then you might look at a straight individual. But the bottom line is you look at the ranking of how decisions are going to be made. Uh, a queer couple, gay couple is the very last option and then because it's the very last option, it really should be no option. All right, and that's, that then becomes state policy until the couple sues, takes it to court, when, um, and this gets rethought out and replayed out and it gets worked on uh, here in the Commonwealth where that's not 
uh, non-mission. You have organizations like GLAD that now have come out of Lambda who are doing the lawsuits. Um, you have, uh, I'm proud to be able to say that at that time, the Dean of Simmons, Simmons the late Diana Walford, who got involved in this case, um, not because she was someone who understood a gay lifestyle, but she understood the difference between right and wrong. And she, she was a patron of fairness, she was an advocate of fairness. This wasn't fair. And so she got involved and used some of her organized skill to put pressure on Dukakis and also to use social science as a way of giving research data that could. Because the, what was the concern? The concern was always somehow that kids living in gay or lesbian families were somehow going to end up being gay or lesbian themselves. And so in 1985, we also have the AIDS and HIV appear um, earlier than that, but that really takes the latter part of the 70s and the 80s. Um, during my tenure as chair of the board at the AIDS Action Committee, what I would say to you is that that period of time really watches the emergence of a community out of crisis, creating systems that didn't exist. So what we see as a result of this pandemic is the creation of the AIDS Action Committee, of Men of Color Against AIDS, Fenway Health changes itself to become a world premier health clinic focusing on LGBT health, not just HIV, and doing the work um, that it continues to do. All of that came out as a response to the epidemic because, in effect, we were being allowed to die um, in cities. It helped us to really uh, think about what it looked like in terms of creating uh, care circles, uh, buddy networks, all of these things that are still used today come out of uh, this period. Uh, and what we know is that out of the gay community, we developed our own newspapers, we created our own bookstores. Uh, we began to go and do some very important work um, which was we began to claim neighborhoods and communities not as ghettos, but to make them thriving uh, communities so that you would not have, as I walk through the South End today and think that the South End as we see it now, um, I don't think it would have, it might have eventually turned, but it, the, you know, it was the energy of gay people that helped to revitalize that community uh, and create the restaurants and create the business industry and the infrastructure that's there. So for 50 years, what we have watched are people who have been put upon uh, by society, by agents of society, particularly when we think about uh, the role of the police um, and legislative bodies, et cetera, who have attempted to legislate and control uh, the ways in which we as part of the community have operated in the world. And we've resisted. Uh, we have fought back and we've continued to resist. When I now look as a soon to be 64 year old, uh, openly gay um, man uh, who has been out for as long as I can remember, I don't even remember being in anymore, um, to really think about what it means when I look at my young students or look at students or look at young family members who don't know I don't remember a time when it was not acceptable. It might not be optimal for them, but it is acceptable <coughs> for them to be and to own queer, to take a term that is so expansive and embracing and to own it and to be able to place themselves in a variety of, of places. It's amazing uh, when you think back on what has happened um, during this period. It's also amazing to think about all the work we still have to do that we need to be able to celebrate where we are, but we have to remain vigilant to do the work that we need to do. Um, the LGBT community, we use the term community, and I'm going to, to and I have been doing this in all of my presentations, we also have a lot of work to do around race, around class, around gender, um, around lots of things that we are not having the hard discussions about. Um, and in closing, I would say, and this is what I say to, to many of my colleagues, oppressed people learn very well how to oppress. They do not learn necessarily how to be generous. And so oppressed people have learned very well what it means to be oppressed and will oppress others, unless they're doing the conscious work to undo what they have learned. Um, 
so that we have to really do the work to address white supremacy, misogyny, ageism, et cetera, in our communities. So thank you all, and let's get to the hands. Hi, I'm Grace Stevens. Grace, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? How long you live in Lexington? Do you live in Lexington? So do our, our stories, our talks. So we do that now? Yes. I'll just jump in. Okay. So, uh, I'm Grace Stevens. I moved to Lexington in 1977. So, I don't know how many years ago. 40-something? 50-something? I am, I was the uh, typical suburban dad. There were three kids here. Um, for many, many, many years, I coached Little League. I, can you write the phone? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. We okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, I coached Little League. I coached USY basketball uh, as, as my kids were going through um, college. Um, my wife, my kids, no one knew that I had uh, uh, issues with my gender. I knew that um, since I was eight years old. Um, I talked a little bit last week at Let's in Pride that I wondered how a nice Jewish boy from Brooklyn mm -hmm. ended up as a transgender woman here in Lexington, Massachusetts. Um, um, you know, one of the interesting things, and, and I'm, I'm really interested in, in your talk of 50 years of Stonewall, and the idea that um, Stonewall, um, we talk about Marsha Johnson, we talk about Sylvia Rivera as two trans women of colors who, who were certainly involved and get some credit for, for being some of the leaders of that. Um, the, the issue of um, being transgender, gender identity disorder, as I mentioned, was like is really only recently <coughs> um, dealt with and, and, and understood. So, for me, growing up in the '60s, there was zero information, absolutely no information. Um, one of the things I do, I, I I am a speaker. I do talk. I do trainings for transgender support. Um, I'm also a counselor, so I go and I, I train other counselors and I train students in counseling. Um, one of the things that I, I talk about is I summarize our human needs as three items. We need to be seen and heard, we need to belong to something, and we need to be touched. For me, growing up in the 60s, my overriding feelings were confusion, shame, and fear. Not being able to even begin to understand what was going on with me. I think that the best way that I can explain how I grew up in my own puberty in, in, in the 60s, uh, the years of Playboy magazine, um, I would get Playboy magazine, I would open to the centerfold, and I would have this conflict of wanting the playmate and wanting to be the playmate. Mm -hmm. So the issue between my gender identity and my sexuality uh, was completely different. And if there's only one thing that you take away from tonight, do not conflate gender identity mm -hmm. and sexual mm -hmm. orientation. Mm -hmm. They are two independent constructs and have nothing to do with each other. When you look at Stonewall, that language was not understood. Mm -hmm. We have no idea what Marshall Johnson what Sylvia Rivera, what the people in the 50s and the 60s were dealing with in their own identity, of how do they be authentic to themselves, where and how do they get their human needs of belonging and being touched met, when there is no way, there is no idea or concept of what this is. Um, I could go on for two hours or three hours. <laughs> That's a whole other level of training and, and history in there. So I'll let it go at that. If you guys want to talk to me, feel free. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Larry Freeman. And I'm Charles James. Uh, we have been in Lexington for about two years now, almost two years now. Uh, I am originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. 
I'm originally from North Carolina. <laughs> um, well, I guess our story is is is, is not unique. Um, I grew up in Pittsburgh, a um, uh, black man and a poor man, so that my coming out story was very different. And I, he, him, uh, his story is black and growing up in the Bible Belt of North Carolina. So both of which presented some challenges. Um, like I said, we've been in Lexington for about two years now. We have a nine-year-old daughter, Paige. Uh, we have been together for 17 years and married for six months. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one thing a lot of people do is ask us why we waited so long to get married. And, and, and I think that's kind of coming, going back to the South and living in the South for so long. Of course, we've only been able to get married in the South for five years, I believe. Five or six years, and of course, I think uh, you have been 18 years or 20, 20 years. 20 years. Um, so, and also coming to such a welcoming environment, it's, it's very different in the South as far as being LGBTQ. Um, the experiences and the day to day that we have to live are, are completely different now than, than they were 50 years ago. Um, I think that Charles and I share certain emotional baggage from growing up, closeted, poor, and black. Mm -hmm. um, years before I met Charles, I used to tell people that I felt like I was gonna die alone. Mm -hmm. And I lived my life that way because I always had a secret, so I could only get so close to anyone. Mm -hmm. So I always had this feeling of, well, I'm probably gonna end up dying alone. <clears throat> You know, I will never truly get to be myself, and then God sent Charles. And moving, even after Charles and I met in the South, they, we still were, we lived together, we were openly gay, but not necessarily at work at home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, or in public, we didn't, you know, we didn't go to the mall and hold hands, we didn't go to restaurants and hold hands, and that kind of thing. But moving to Lexington has really, you know, shown us a whole new avenue of opportunities that we've never experienced before. Even the thought of having this kind of conversation in a town or building is something that we never thought we would, you know, be part of. So mm -hmm. for that, we're grateful and very humble. Mm -hmm. I think we'll take Larry and Charles Q and introduce ourselves together <laughs> to give you some context and then separate. My name is Meg. I'm Sarah. And we're married. I have never lived in Lexington. Sarah grew up here. We got married in the church down the street at Hancock United um, almost two years ago. Gotta keep that straight. <laughs> um, and I am now 31. I came out when I was a senior in college. Um, just as a, a result of a really safe community. Um, being in college, you grow a lot and learn a lot about yourself, and I think that's part of why I ended up coming out at that point. I haven't had, um, I don't have a really tragic story. I don't have a lot of experiences where anyone shut the door in my face for being gay or, you know, anything monumental, but it certainly changed how I view life and how comfortable I am being gay. So it certainly made me who I am having my coming out experience. Um, I think what we are dealing with now, I'll say what I'm struggling with now the most is our future and having children and thinking about when I go to change jobs, do their benefits include IVF? Do their benefits include helping me have children as much as a heterosexual employee? So we, we discuss that a lot, and it's a serious concern, it's expensive. So I always think about what do gay couples do that don't have mm -hmm. the opportunities that we've had, because we do have the money to afford it. So it's, it's very institutional barriers we look at now, which is something we, I try to be present with. Um, but I'm happy to be here and yeah, with my wife. <laughs> Um, one thing that uh, has been coming to mind a little bit as I've listened to the presentation, um, so I did grow up here um, my whole life, I'm a second generation Lexington citizen member, um, and I grew up going to Hancock 
United Church of Christ on the street, which uh, even though they only officially became an open and affirming congregation in the 90s, um, as far as I can remember, um, attending events and services there, it was never a question that anyone was welcome to be there. Um, and then they did adopt the open and affirming status, which just further kind of affirmed all that. Um, but I definitely was pretty naive uh, in, a little, in you know, the bubble that this town is that we're lucky to experience. Um, when I was a senior in high school at LHS, um, when the Westboro Baptist Church came, um, prompted by uh, something that had happened at one of the elementary schools, um, there was a I want to say kindergarten or first grade teacher that had a diversity bag that each kid took a turn bringing home, and there was a book about what makes a family, and that discussed a you know gay parenting couple, um, and so the kid brought that home, had conservative parents who were very upset about that, uh, made a big deal about that, and how and asked that his child never be included in conversations spontaneous or planned about LGBT issues, which the school obviously said can't do that. Um, and then also at LHS, we did every year the Day of Silence to uh, recognize um, you know, the, the silence that all of us experience at some point or another, um, be it before we've come out or even uh, you know, in those moments where you're trying to feel out job or a new situation, is it okay for me to fully be myself um, or is it better for me to just be silent about that part of me? So anyway, the, the four years I had been at LHS, we had always had that and there had never been any issue. So again, contributing to my sense of kind of being naive about <laughs> what it was really like to be part of that community. Um, and so I don't know if the two things are related, but there just so happened to be a group of people, parents, who felt they wanted to protest the Day of Silence. Um, so these two events were covered by the media and got the attention of Westboro Baptist Church, um, who put, you know, all kinds of their trademark classy language up about my classmates and I and the people in this town. Um, and they decided to come, and it happened to be the day of my graduation. They um, were, they organized this whole itinerary of protests in front of every um, open and affirming or LGBT accepting congregation and temple throughout the town. And they would uh, do their protesting in front of each of those um, houses of worship the 30 minutes before the service was supposed to start there. So the intention was to scare people away from coming to worship together. And so the town, um, you know, I, I lost a little bit of my naivete, but then I also learned a lot because the town rallied together um, and we had all these uh, sessions about how do we um, respond to this. And so I was part of a group of Lexington citizens, maybe from other towns as well, but we um, sort of counter-protested silently because people who had experience with this group knew that they just build off of whatever you say. You, you're not going to win a, a verbal argument with them. But what we thought was important was we want to counteract what they're trying to do. We want to show support for these places of worship and their communities, and we want to physically be welcoming to people as they're coming in to counteract all this hate and just, you know, it's just disgusting what they do. Um, so that was an interesting <laughs> life moment, um, coinciding with graduation, very symbolically. Um, and then I'll just say briefly something sort of interesting about my um, own experience discovering my sexuality. I went to, I was not really clear on that um, growing up or in high school. I went to Mount Holyoke for college, which is an all women's college. Um, and it is a wonderful place. I love my experience there. The people I still have in my life from that time are just hopefully always gonna be important to me. Um, so being in that community, there's, you see a lot of things that you don't necessarily just encounter in your day-to-day -day life anywhere else or that I hadn't. Um, there were a lot of people, uh, women dating women, a lot of people, you 
maybe not a lot, but at least a few people transitioning genders, and everything was accepted, everything was okay, so again, kind of a bubble, um, where it was sort of extremely accepting, which was great, but then once I started to think about myself and what made sense for me, um, and who I was attracted to, and who I maybe wanted to date, um, it's very interesting, sort of the layers, there were all these terms that I started to learn about. Are you a uh, came here queer? Are you a lesbian until graduation? Like, what's your deal, you know? So, um, it can be, uh, you know, within our own community, unfortunately, there can be um, subdivisions, there can be discrimination even among ourselves. Um, so that's been interesting to just sort of work through. Um, in my life since, well, pre coming out and then uh, getting married. So, and yeah, like she said, we got married down the street, so full circle, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> So there are a lot of issues going on. 
I haven't been able to bind my chest very often due to physical health reasons. And I'm aware that I don't look how most people would expect someone going into a men's room to look. After a few incidents of people yelling, staring, laughing at me, or trying to physically prevent me from using the men's room, I decided that in most cases, it isn't worth it. Ideally, all bathrooms would be gender neutral and wheelchair accessible, but we aren't there yet. Recently, it feels like things are getting worse. Ballot question three put my rights as a trans person to avoid discrimination in public places up for public debate. Well, fortunately, question three passed. On a national level, the Trump administration has proposed to allow health care providers to discriminate against trans patients. According to the 2015 U.S. Transgender Survey, 23% of transgender people avoided going to the doctor when sick or injured out of fear of discrimination. And 33% of transgender people who saw a health care provider were harassed, denied care, or even assaulted. I tell my doctors my chosen name and pronouns once. But after that, I don't usually say anything for fear of getting worse care. My record says that I'm transgender and that I use the name Noah, but many doctors ignore that. I've had my fair share of unprofessional health providers, but it is hard to know if my gender has been a factor. In August, there's going to be a straight pride parade here in Boston. One of the organizers frequently attends rallies from the far right and it has advocated for violence against his opponents. Sometimes it is hard for me to feel safe. After overhearing transphobic comments on the T, I took all the LGBT pins off my backpack. I still wear my pronoun necklace, but often under my shirt instead of above. I think about the people who voted no on ballot question three, the people who yell at me when I march in pride parades, and the people who hate me without even knowing me, and I start to feel overwhelmed. However, seeing everyone who has come here and being able to meet people who are fighting for equality gives me hope. Thank you. Responses, questions. Questions or responses? I have a response to Noah's um, very powerful um, statement. And it's to highlight for this audience, you know, in our last gubernatorial election, there was a candidate, Scott Miley. Um, Scott Miley uh, is a pastor um, who is, lives in Western Mass. Um, he is most well known because he is considered the architect of the anti-homosexuality uh, law in Uganda that um, decided that it was not enough to legislate against, we should just, Mushevini decided that people should just be killed, let's just um, you know, execute homosexuals. And Scott Lively, who's been in doing a lot of work in Uganda, is basically credited with that, that idea. But he says he didn't intend for it to go that far. Um, he's wanted for uh, war crimes, human rights violations. Um, he ran for governor. He got 100,000 votes in Massachusetts. 100,000 votes in Massachusetts in the, in, the, in the primary. I say that to remind us that we too live in a bubble here in this so-called progressive state of ours, which really isn't as progressive as we want to think. We'll get out of the bubble of Boston or Lexington or Brookline or any of those places that are uh, very, or Provincetown, that are quite ugly. Um, because when we think about the rest of the state, um, I'm reminded of what a dear friend of mine says whenever I visit, I visit him in Amsterdam. He says, don't confuse Amsterdam with the rest of the country. We can't confuse the bubbles that we're in with the rest of the state that we have work to do. And it's so important to think about. We've seen calls to hotlines go up with question three. We've seen um, 
anything that comes out of the Trump administration, so then the trauma, um, the post, the secondary, the primary trauma that shows up, that these are triggering moments for us. If you think what's going on right now, that we're now at the 10th, they've just had the 10th murder of a black trans woman this year, uh, and we don't know what's going on in Dallas where these numbers are. Staggering that the news is talking about what's happening to American tourists in the Dominican Republic and not talking about the numbers of deaths of American trans women of color in the state of Texas. So I just want to raise that. As you think about being here in Lexington, um, and you think about um, it as a, as a bubble, and I don't think you know Lexington that, that well. What makes it gay affirming? Is it gay affirming? Is it a positive place to be gay? Besides the banners, we can put up banners anywhere. No, 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 I don't think banners are a great thing, but does that mean something about the town? One thing that I would just like to, um, Please. you know, just uh, expanding on what you said is that, you know, in many ways Lexington is a bubble, right? Because we we do have a, a pretty inclusive, welcoming community in a lot of ways. On the other hand, for ballot question three, which put up um, the uh, the law that protects transgender people from discrimination in public places that was put up to public, public, popular vote. In Lexington, one in three voters voted against. Mm -hmm. One in three. So if you're a transgender person in Lexington, especially, I mean, I think transgender people of all ages, but transgender young people walking through our streets, one, two, three, one, two, three. Mm -hmm. One out of three people, one out of three voters, voted to make it legal to discriminate against you. Here in Lexington, we have had LGBT students thrown violently out of their homes when out to their parents. So while there's a lot of good going on here in Lexington, we are not immune from these issues. Uh, my son, who is transgender, uh, is co-president of the GSA at Lexington High School. Um, and so I know a lot of the kids, a lot of the teenagers who are LGBT. Um, and Let's Pride, at one of our socials, uh, offered to do an event for the Let's Pride social, right, for Let's Pride members, um, honoring LGBT students who graduated. So first, only a fraction of LGBT students felt able to tell us. Mm -hmm. Second, of the people who did tell us that they were LGBT graduating, 80% asked to remain anonymous, mm -hmm. even at a alleged crime mm -hmm. So, like, I don't at all want to kind of underplay the progress that we've made because we've made so much progress. For me, personally, I was threatened with death when I was growing up in the 60s as a young lesbian woman. So I know there's, I've lived that history too. You know, I see those differences. Um, it's easy to, to overgeneralize though mm -hmm. and forget about those people who are still
I kind of grew up like, uh, like uh, you and, and wasn't exactly sure who, who or what I was. I know I, I knew I wasn't attracted to women the way that my friends were, but I also wasn't attracted to men necessarily. Um, until I saw OJ Simpson and his family on, on the front of the Essence magazine. <laughs> hey, there's something going on. But, uh, but um, so when I did realize who I was, I actually withdrew myself. And I didn't want to share it with my family, I didn't want to share it with my friends. So I basically moved out of my home and moved out of my family's life and my friend's life. So I kind of and, and no one knew where I was or who I was, and I rather I would rather have that at that point than shun with my family that for that to go. Um, I came out at a, a much later age. I was, you know, in my late twenties, so I was already not living at home. I was living in a different town than the rest of my family. I never moved back out of college. So I was already living pretty much independently. I had been married, had kids, divorced, and then I came out. <clears throat> so my loneliness, I felt like I was, I kept a secret so long that even when I came out, I couldn't let go of that mechanism that made me hold back from connecting. So even when I came out, I was still very closeted as far as there were only certain things I would talk to even another gay man about. It's only certain conversations I would have. I would go to a lot of gay places where I knew a lot of gay people were going to be. Like I would have never gone to a gay party when I first came out. I just didn't want to be seen, not because I was ashamed, but I was so used to being closeted that, you know, the hinges on the door had rushed in. It was just hard to push open. <laughs> <laughs> and I will say, kind of speaking about the bubble, um, I definitely, I mean, I, I, we love Lexington, but Lexington is a bit of a bubble, especially <laughs> coming from the South, and um, especially, and it's very impactful that we grew up poor because that kind of brings in a whole another set of issues. Um, but Lexington is a great place. Um, and kind of speaking what you were speaking, my, my daughter actually came home a few months ago and said, uh, that's okay. Mm -hmm. So I actually had to sit down, and have you heard that expression yet? So I had to actually sit there, that's the expression that some of the kids asked, oh. So I actually had to sit, sit down with her and explain to her why that's not a good thing. Um, yeah, but it, it, it still is happening, it still is happening. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I hear from students um, in middle school and high school that, um, especially the athletes, but other students too, like the guys when they give each other a raw hug or what, fist bump or whatever, they say no homo. And they, you know, we have LGBT students um, who hear that multiple times every day, day in, day out. Yeah, there's a wonderful film, if, if it's a sweet little film called Love, Simon. Anyone see that? Yeah. It's a very sweet little film. Um, and it shows the power. We don't know who's listening uh, because we don't know what people haven't told us. And so you can be the most wonderful, loving family. And if you're saying things as a joke to a child who hasn't come out, who's hearing, you make fag jokes or homo jokes or this joke. Um, they don't know that you're not talking about them. So we really do, um, and, and the, that wonderful song from uh, Into the Woods from Sondheim, you know, we really have to be careful what we say. Children are listening, children will hear. And we sometimes don't understand that they don't get the joke. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to be the joke. Okay. That's, that's a powerful thing. Did you? Yeah, I, I want to add something. So in my own evolution, fairly recently is, I'm pretty out there um, and known as being trans and an activist, but you can Google me, I'm all over the internet in my writing and speaking and stuff. But as I meet people now, I'm at this interesting point where I do not have to introduce myself as trans. And and it, it's, my two best friends are cis, and it's clearly not an issue. Mm -hmm. 
uh, of what comes up. So I get caught now in the idea of my own identity mm -hmm. and which sense of identity is most important in the relationships that I create. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's very it's it's very interesting to me as I look back as I look back over my life, but I'm not looking that far back over my life. Um, is to think about it. having been out since I was I came out when I was fourteen or something like that. It's, it, when I say I've been out so long that I don't remember when I was not, um, that that it was. It, it was for me about having a sense of agency. I needed to control my own narrative. I didn't use that language then. Um, and the only people that I needed to, so going back into the 50s, 60s, that I needed, or 70s, we needed to negotiate with were my parents. And if they were okay, the rest of the world would fall in place. And they were okay. It took us a little time, because you know, my mom was born in 1916, my father 1919. My brother and I were born very late, so I was being raised by my grandparents in some ways. Um, so it was a lot for them to traverse, but they did. And I never looked back wanting anyone to prove as long as I had theirs. This was all that mattered to me. Um, and so the point of social isolation was it allows you to be in your own space when you know you've got something that anchors you, that connects you to something that's solid. Um, you know, going to be out, I went to a prep school where I was at, I was popular. Um, what it meant to go to Tufts and, and to be out and to be ostracized. So I've never been, and basically for my freshman year, really spent most of my freshman year eating alone because the queer kids didn't want to be around them because I outed them <laughs> by virtue of my being, because I was really gay. <laughs> Unapologetically. And black kids didn't want to be around me either, so I didn't have a nexus, so my nexus became lost, and that's where I made my friendship network. But it also helped me understand what isolation can feel like, and what it can continue to be like, and how you can fill that space with all sorts of things that are distractions. Um, now as you get older, it's very interesting. I've had my friendships, I, I'm serial monogamous, I've had long-term relationships, but what does it mean now that I don't have an ended a 17 year relationship of looking at, okay, what is it going to look like now as I move into that next phase of life will be very interesting um, to see what that, what that looks like. The data shows, the research shows social isolation is one of the most dangerous things that can happen to human beings. It kills. And so it is not necessarily having an immediate love relationship, those were wonderful but had their friends. And you know, and, and that's what I encourage people to have if you can be your authentic self so that people can get to know you versus the facade of you. Um, that's where they can then you can really get connected to folks. And that's a powerful, I think a very powerful piece. Getting older is great. <laughs> Look forward to it. It's, it's a great gift. It's a great gift. Well, we are past the, the time. So I want to thank all of you for sitting here. I want to thank Candace for being here. And I want to thank you to, and to take the opportunity to, to, to keep up your own learning so that if you want to watch, uh, if you go see a film like me. See a film like Love Simon. See a film. Um, uh, see the show Pummels. Jen Simon, another great film. Um, you know, but see these things that are now there. I think Pose right now on Fox FX is one of the best things out there because it's from the story of the So good night, everyone.